Welcome everyone. It's great to be back on campus for this new school year. I'm John Brzezinski and I uh, direct the University of Minnesota China Center. We are here today for the webinar, Who's Afraid of Big Bad Dragon? Why China Has the Best and the Worst Education System in the World with Dr. Yong Zhao. I'd like to thank you very much for joining us today and for your support of the China Center and this webinar series. We are very grateful for your generosity. Your support helps make our programs possible. And I offer our very special thanks to Kai Mei and Joseph Terry for their generous support of this program. And we invite you to help us advance our mission and give to the China Center through the link on our webinar announcement or on our website. At the end of the program, we'll entertain some questions from all of you that you submit through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. If you have technical difficulty or need help, please uh, use the chat and somebody will respond. It's a very special treat for me to welcome our speaker, Dr. Young Zhao. I've known Dr. Zhao for many years now, and I've always found his perspectives on education system in China to be very insightful. Uh, there is so much to learn from the successes and failures of China's education system, and how does this inform our own thinking about the U.S. educational system? Dr. Zhao is a foundational distinguished professor in the School of Education at the University of Kansas and a professor in educational leadership at Melbourne Graduate School of Education in Australia. He's pre previously served as a presidential chair, associate dean, and director of Institute for Global and Online Education in College Education in University of Oregon, where he has also been a professor in the Department of Educational Measurement, Policy, and Leadership. Wow, there's more to say, but I will um, get right to it. So please, everybody, welcome Dr. Zhao. Thank you, Joan, and thanks, Haiyan, for organizing this. It is just uh, great to be talking about China. Is uh, is is right now? I think China is a very interesting and sensitive topic at this moment, uh, politically speaking, you know, it's, uh, we know in this country and in the world right now, China is considered uh, a competitor. China is, cons you know, we've always considered China as a competitor, uh, but but it's more of a strategic, almost like enemy-like. Uh, this is a, a very difficult time uh, to be, to be really thinking about how we view China and uh, what we think about uh, China can do and will be able to do. Uh, so um, I want to really start by, um, by saying that uh, what we need at this moment, all of us, you know, those on the webinar, you know, who are attending this, we should really take a very uh, historical and rational view on this. I'm sure all of you are since you are joining this uh, uh, webinar. You know, we, we need to think about uh, um, the people beyond the government. We need to think about uh, education beyond politics. We need to think about human beings beyond economical or geographical competitions. Uh, so so that, that I wrote this book, um, Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Dragon, uh, many years ago. And the, the, this book, first of all, was really um, in response to a lot of the well-known people at that time writing about China. Thomas Friedman, for example, you know, um, who wrote that you know, the world is flat. Uh, we have uh, other books talking about surpassing Shanghai. Uh, we have um, actually China Inc. was another book uh, that, that was written. A lot of the observers at that time were praising China, were praising China's effort, China's growth. And uh, you know, around 2008, China had the uh, um, Olympic games and that really marked its opening up. And so um, this book was really in response to the, what I call the almost unreasonable uh, um, misunderstanding of China. So uh, this is the book, and uh, it's called Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Dragon? There was fear. There was hope. There was a lot of things about China. So, for example, you know, I was just going to show you some of this. You know, there's some, some of the people. It's kind of silly. Um, I, I love this one, uh, Ed Randos, uh, uh, Pennsylvania governor, who was uh, 
commenting about the rescheduling of a national uh, football league game, NFL game. And he was saying, you know, we've become a nation of Uzis. The Chinese are kicking our butt in everything. If this was in China, do you think the Chinese would have caught off the game? It was raining, it has a little snowstorm. And he continued to say on his radio shows that people would have been marching down to the stadium. They would have walked and they would have been doing calculus on the way down. It's, a, it's just a fascinating way of comparing how China become or became at that time the major competitor uh, to the US education. Then that's not only in the US, but also in other countries like uh, uh, the Sydney Morning Herald. Uh, was talking about a Grattan Institute, uh, which was really affiliated with the University of Melbourne uh, in Australia. It says a Grattan Institute report to be released today shows Australian performance has slipped since 2000 with math students now more than two years behind children in Shanghai. Uh, and then you, there, there's also another one, you know, Michael Gove, the Brit you know, in, in Britain, uh, the British Secretary of State for Education said, I'm happy to confess, I'd like us to implement a cultural revolution, just like the one they've had in China. Like Chairman Ma, we've embarked on a long march to reform our education system, which actually, um, right now, you know, you, you, you might know that Elizabeth Truss, the new Prime Minister of uh, Britain, who actually um, introduced and brought math and math teachers from Shanghai to England. And this is uh, you know, quite, quite interesting. This is another book that's uh, done by Mark Tucker, um, who is basically, uh, is called Surpassing Shanghai, what we can learn from China, you know, by Shanghai. And at that time, you know, Arnie Duncan, the Secretary of Education said, you know, China's performance on the test score, the PISA, was a wake up call and Barack Obama called it a Sputnik moment. This is quite, quite fascinating, all of this. And if you think about the, um, the data they had was basically uh, the PISA test, the performance of uh, um, the PISA is a program for international student assessment, which measures math, sciences and reading. And the first time China participated, which basically was students in Shanghai. All of you know, Shanghai is the best problem city in the most, uh, you know, westernized uh, city, very large. And recent has been in the COVID lockdown, uh, performed number one, had great test scores. So the, the, this view of China as uh, being the best was really amazing. But this data, we should really um, question it. It, it. It's quite interesting to say, well, does that mean American education is in decline and American education was getting worse? So I've been tracing that to say, was American education getting worse? Was it in decline? And uh, I have to tell you, you know, American education based on test scores, it was not in decline, was not getting worse. It has always been bad. American students' test scores never got any really better than other countries. If you look at the uh, 1960s, the first international mathematics study, FIMS, Americans' 12th graders ranked 12th out of 12 countries, 12 out of 12 countries. Now, if you know math, that's bad. That's really bad. So 1960s, we've been bad for that long. And actually, if you look at this data, it was getting better. And so, but China remains. By the way, actually, if you go back, Americans have always identified enemies. And we always believe enemies are doing better. And it as if, you know, the US policies cannot move forward without being worse than others. We got to have an enemy. For example, you know, the Sputnik moment, 1958, 
that was the year after 1957. 1957 was the year when the Soviet Union, former Soviet Union, launched Sputnik, uh, the first man-made satellite. Uh, at that time, there was a lot of interest in education in the Soviet Union. So Life Magazine, uh, 1958, had a really cover story called Crisis in Education. And it made a really interesting comparison. Why, you know, inside the photos, for example, should Alexei, who is Russian or, or Soviet Union in Moscow, was doing complicated experiments in physics and chemistry and reading aloud from Sister Curry. And this Stephen, which is near, I guess, you know, Minnesota in Chicago, by contrast, retreated from a geometry problem on the blackboard and the caption advised. Stephen amused class with the wise cracks about his ineptitude. Seated a typewriter in typing class, Stephen tells us, I type about one word a minute. So American education was bad. And then in the 1980s, we had a, a great book uh, out of University of Michigan, actually, it's called The Learning Gap, which uh, was written by Harold Stevenson and uh, uh, James Stigler talk about why our education in our schools are, for, are failing and what we can learn from Japanese and Chinese education. So this is a very interesting um, way to think about how good is Chinese education and how bad it can be. I'm sure, you know, uh, John and others uh, and many of you who are interested in this phenomenon have been observing this. For example, if uh, Chinese education were that good, why were there so many Chinese students coming to America? What did they come here to look for? What's the difference? And then if Chinese education were that great, why China has not become the most innovative or inventive country? US remains perhaps really the top, you know, innovative countries. Why is that? So I, I, I began to look for other, some other data. It's kind of interesting. And the question, you know, I, I had was that, uh, you, you know, if American education has been so bad, and uh, why are we still here? That's another question I've always raised. You know, if we're so bad, our test scores have been bad since the 1960s, since the first international mathematics study. Why is America still here? And here's what really uh, you can find that is uh, quite interesting. If you look at only test scores, not only China, but all East Asian countries are much better than American students. But then there is another source of data about something different. That is uh, the non-cognitive, non-cognitive, which is really, you know, one of them is called uh, confidence. So look at the data, you will find that uh, American students have always been more confident based on this data. This data, by the way, is the survey data that accompanied all these tests, which is seldom shown in the US media. The US media always focus on test scores. And, but now we we'll say, okay, why is America still here? You gotta go back to the idea about confidence. So American students, you know, we may be bad, but we don't think we're bad. We're pretty good, you know, you know, so the, this is the, what I, I showed this little cartoon was really interesting. You know, we may be bad, but we're not. And that data carries on in all sorts of places. So if you look at this data, you know, again, you want to see, this is 2011 math scores and confidence of select different countries. 
you look at math scores, this is eighth grade, by the way, uh, Korea, Singapore, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Japan, they are, they're almost you know, over 100 points higher than US, England, and Australia. I call them Anglo-Saxon countries. But look at the confidence level, Korea, look at Singapore, look at Taiwan, and then you look at the US, Australia, and then whether they value math or not. You know, they are doing great, but they don't value math as much. And then there's data continues. Basically, there is um, negative correlation between test scores and uh, confidence and enjoyment. And it goes on, goes in many different ways. Uh, for example, you know, there's uh, other data, the PISA data, which shows the correlation between PISA and entrepreneurship indicators. You know, they are, it's all negative correlation. Look at this, uh, the red bars are the test scores. And this is the entrepreneurship confidence, which basically asks, you know, do you think you can run or start a business? And then later on, you move on to PISA, revealed this. This is uh, shows that how test scores and life satisfaction is a negative correlation. You look at this is China, Beijing, Shanghai, Zhejiang, uh, Jiangsu and Zhejiang, Hong Kong, Macau, Taiwan. And so, so they have high scores, but low satisfaction. And, uh, you know, here basically it says students scored above the OECD average in reading, but reported lower levels of life satisfaction than average of 15 year olds. And uh, so this, th this is also says students who were classified as very satisfied with the life scored 16 points lower in reading. So this is uh, um, where we want to think about what matters, why China is, uh, has high scores, but low confidence. And uh, in education, we have to think about multiple, multiple measures. You know, like when you go to a, a doctor, you know, you, you go there, they tell you, you're, oh my God, you know, your, your blood pressure is great. And are you happy with that? Maybe your, your heart rate is not good. Maybe you have diabetes. So one indicator does that indicate what really matters. So I did a lot of really research. Here's something we discover, which is normally ignored. Number one, uh, as people from the China Center know very well that uh, Chinese students are subject to testing pressures much more than Americans. Uh, American students, you know, we have the SAT, the ACT, standardized testing, but they do not influence a lot of our classroom, our curriculum. And by Chinese students, the real Chinese students, I'm not talking about what's been reported. They spend a lot more time on the subjects that's tested, that matters. Although there's no national test, technically, until college entrance exam, the college entrance exam you know, has a trickle down effect. Basically, it's still not a really entirely national test. Every province has its test, but it's moving towards more national. Used to be one test. Then later on had some little liberation, and now it's going back to national test. And that has a trickle down effect because everybody at the end of high school has to do that. And then before high school, there's a, you know, at the end of middle school, about uh, ninth grade, you have to pass another exam to be divided into, we call this general high school, which really enables you to go to college. 
and the vocational high school, vocational, uh, you know, coming agricultural, coming anything, but that track almost has no chance of going to college. So that's one test. And you go back to elementary school, there's test again to select you. Now even kindergarten selects kids, you know, how's your English? You know, English, by the way, is in decline right now at this moment. China is putting less emphasis on English now. China has just shut down all this English tutoring, you know, companies, you know, it's the, so that drives the whole society into forcing children to do testing preparation. So I've called Chinese education, as I wrote in the book, it's not education, it's test preparation. And then that relates to the idea about uh, the majority of Chinese parents, teachers, treat taking the test as the most important thing. So whatever is tested matters. So getting that an education means passing a test, which I hope all of you would reflect on that. That is quite dangerous because education is supposed to help us to develop our values, to develop the personal competence and abilities. It's not to pass the test. Now, when you try to force people to pass the test and everybody learns to be compliant. So you, in my book, Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Dragon, you can trace that testing back to the old imperial you know, exams since the Qin dynasty or Tang dynasty been thousands of years. The idea, you know, those, those tests were basically to serve the ruling class. The emperors wanted it. You know, imagine how do you, how do you get rid of people who might oppose against you? As many of you know, the emperors, you know, they, they get power basically by trying to get rid of their relatives you know, a lot of times. And so in order to preserve the power, they want to give all the wealth benefits to their relatives, but they want the ruling class from the public. So they invent a test and they invented the test. It was really interesting. So if you had any resource and uh, you won't pass this test, but very few people actually can pass this test or could pass this test. And if you could not pass the test, what do you do? You go back to teach others to pass the test. So a lot of people, you know, who did not make it, make it through the imperial exam to serve the emperors, you go back to teach others. So you pass on that culture. Even though that exam, the imperial exam was uh, officially uh, ended in 1905. But the tradition, the cultural tradition of using tests to select people has not ended. And China has gone through a lot of education reforms, as many of you are very well aware. I mean, like recently, they are still implementing the new college entrance exam reforms in different provinces, but it did not change the nature of education test preparation, because you always select people and place people in the hierarchy. And there's another thing I, I want to add, the hierarchy is very depressing. And we, many Americans, I would say, mistakenly view that as a good thing. And we call that meritocracy. That is, you build a hierarchy. If you do well, you pass the exam, you, you go up. And so in China, there's a, you know, this little uh, belief, you can never be, you can, you can only be better than others, you cannot be the best. You can be better, but you cannot be the best, because there's always someone above you until you reach the very top as emperor, which is kind of scary place, I wouldn't want to become an emperor. So you're always, someone is always doing better than you. So if you go to all this colleges, technically China probably has an oversupply of the number of universities and it's been growing a lot, but the competition for testing 
has gotten worse than the time I went to college. You know, I went to college in 1980s. I probably, you know, at that time, the admissions rate might be 4%. Right now, we are reaching 60, 70%, depending on where you are. I did not feel I went through an education system that's worse than today. China's education is truly what I call a creativity killing machine. So if you go through this, not only the force to take the test, in order for you to do better on test, you just have to comply with whatever test you want. So that's why in Chinese schools, you know, the last year of high school doesn't teach you new things. It's all, it's basically practice and test. They get all test items from different schools, different provinces, they mark them, sell them, all students, every day they do, is take the test and analyze the test. They try to exhaust the possibilities of testing. And then of course, time. I have a friend who has a, a daughter right now, at this moment is in the last year of high school. They have seven days a week maximum of half a day break. They're in school 14 hours a day. And imagine that. Now, how can you be happy with that? Education is much broader than what you study in a test. So when people ask me, how do I, why American students are more creative. How do they teach creativity in the US? I said, well they, well, they really don't teach creativity any better. If you go to our schools, I would not say we teach creativity better. And by the way, American education has got worse, has missed really three decades, at least three decades of changes because of no child left behind because of our attempt, because of our attempt to learn from East Asian countries. In the 1980s, we learned from Japan. 1990s, we learned from Singapore math. In the 2000s, we learned from China. And we have got our education much worse. But I tell them, I said, if you go to America, there are probably three things I can, I said that they do creativity better. First of all, you go, you should go visit the school talent shows in elementary school. I remember going to my children's talent shows in schools, elementary school. You go there, it's kind of fascinating, but if from a dictatorial perspective, you will think it's just a mess. Somebody's doing dancing, others doing violin, others doing piano, some people doing kung fu, martial arts, you know, it's crazy. But that is precisely the source of American creativity. That is because we allow students to define what talent is. We enable our students, we enable our teachers to encourage our children to be themselves. We're losing that. Allowing people to de define talent, to think what they're good at is very powerful. So you can gain confidence that you are good at something. We don't have the same kind of creativity killing machine because government defines what you are and what you should be good at. The government is a selector. So I have been fighting Americans' education system moving towards state standardized testing. I failed, you know, because uh, every state in the US has standardized testing. And standardized testing, even though they do not have impact on really on children, but they have impact on schools, on real estate and housing market. Uh, you know, if your test scores are good, your house sells better because you are in a good neighborhood, you're good in a good community. But those tests are horrible in helping American education to get better. 
The second thing that I learned very early on that I think cultivated Americans' creativity and inventiveness is uh, uh, from my, my son's first uh, second grade teacher, Mrs. March Lippi. She told me, he said, I mean, I believe uh, this was in Michigan. I, I was in Michigan for 15 years. I was teaching at a Michigan State University. She was telling me, said, you know, I believe children like popcorn. Some pop early, some pop late. And I love that. It was a great metaphor. You know, of course, except the few who get burned, everybody is happy, you know. That's a beautiful statement. We do not predetermine what children should be. We, do, we allow children to grow. We allow children to develop. We do not force students to meet the government expectations. But again, we've lost that. We've lost that. A lot of teachers today in America are forced to subject their children to requirements, to government requirements. I think it's a huge mistake. And then the third one is, I don't think many observers in education examine is education is a process of growing. Look at in America, how many museums we have, how many libraries we have, and movies. You know, our children are scattered in various things. And when you spend 12 or 13 years from kindergarten to 12th grade, where are you going? If you spend more time knowing the society, if you spend more time exposing to arts, to music, to dancing, or to scientific affairs, science affairs, to all the museums, inventions, you are much more likely to be inspired in those opportunities. And you read differently. You play games differently. All of this actually enriches and diversifies education. So if you think about China is the, the best in taking tests, truly taking tests, the government, the education system, the society, in essence has created a test preparation machine in China. And of course, those who pass the test have become compliant. They have become very, very much you know, compliant to the system. And those who did not pass wasted their time. They did not learn much that was meaningful, that's useful for their life. So that is facing a big waste. So if you look at test scores, it's the best. But it is the worst in terms of education. It's not helping people developing a sense of value, developing a sense that I want to do something. It's not helping individuals to become the best they can be because they have to become the best the government want them to be. It's a competition. You know, it manufactures what I call losers. It's a, it's a, because in order to beat someone, you don't even have to be good. You just have to make other people worse than you. And it is the worst in cultivating invention and innovation, which really comes down to the point. Many people ask me, which I wrote actually in, in, in the book, Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Dragon? Is China going to become innovative? Is China going to overtake America? You know, of course, you know, right now everything is a guess. But from my analysis is that Chinese students, Chinese students, the majority of them are not going to become innovative. And they cannot be innovative. It's impossible because they have learned to lose their passion, to lose their interest, to lose their confidence, to lose their enjoyment about invention. What is invention? I am actually on the advisory board 
for a foundation based in Portland, Oregon is called the Lemosin Foundation. The Lemosin Foundation is quite interesting. It really promotes invention and invention education. It was founded by Jerry Lemosin, who himself was a huge in American inventor. He believes we have to invent to make our life better. So we just had a meeting, we chatted about it. What, what makes invention? Invention is actually, if simply speaking, it's called being able to identify problems that are worth solving. Identify basically significant problems and then come up with a unique solution. So in our schools, we, we never teach children how to identify problems. This is even in America, American education. American education, as I said, we've been, we are becoming a test preparation system, but really education is supposed to help people identify problems, problems that matter to them, problems that are, are of significance. Then through solving these significant problems, our children can create solutions, solutions that have impact on other people's lives, solutions that have impact on the world for the better. Uh, you know, myself right now, I'm working on a book with a number of people on the issue about making an impact. So for, I guess, you know, to this conversation or the webinar is really trying to draw lessons from American education. I believe in American education, we are, we got to jump out of the mess that no child left behind has created. Stop prescribing for children. Stop testing our children. We need to move on to leading our children to identify problems, to learn to solve problems. It's not only problem solving skills. It is every child has their unique strength unique values. And if we can mobilize our children to apply their uniqueness to solve problems that are worth solving and deliver impact on others, our children will be happier. Our children will be more engaged. You know, right now in this country, in the US, we have this mass resignation. A lot of people don't work. They quit, why? Because job itself is not rewarding, is not engaging. Our students have lost interest as well. So I'm hoping that all of us will learn from the lessons in China, which is total control, test-driven, and devoting all the time to learning school subjects doesn't work. It is not the education of the future. It is an education that defended an agricultural society for thousands of years, but it's not gonna deliver the future for us. What American education needs is one that's more open, more liberal, like our talent shows, that enables and gives time to our children to develop themselves. Like what my son's first grade teacher said, you know, popcorns. Some pop early, some pop late. We need to rethink. Children's uniqueness matters. Children's active agency matters. Children's passion matters. So ultimately, a good education is one that enables everybody to be as unique as they can be, so they can be more engaged and happy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zhao. This is wonderful. I really appreciate uh, your time with us today. And I know we can get going on some questions. Very excited that there are a few stacked up here. So um, <clears throat> what are the students' scores in other parts of China besides the main cities? And what about poor students in large cities? Well, that's a very tough question. China's huge, 1.4 billion so far. 
has a lot of students. I, I myself, I came out of a tiny village. I call it the most extraordinarily ordinary village. So I can tell you from my village, from very poor. So people in poor areas, they're still subject to the same kind of testing scheme. And if you are interested, you can subject yourself to years of test preparation. But in my family, you know, I got uh, three sisters, a younger brother, and none of them finished beyond third grade. And so, so you know, it's it is very hard. And my, my brother says, I I'm, I studied everything he wanted to study, so he did not he was not interested in that anymore. And so, so in the countryside, in the poor areas in northwest China, it's still very hard. Uh, the education conditions are not very good. In the cities, uh, remember China has this thing called Hu Kou. That you know, it's basically your family registration or residential residence registration. You may be living in Shanghai or Beijing, but you're not allowed in the education system. And so like your father or mother may be working in Shanghai as a migrant worker, but the children have to go back to their old place to go to school, take the test. And, uh, and a few years ago, migrant workers built uh, schools for their children, but their, their children are not allowed to take tests over there. They have to go back. So there's this uh, huge discrimination. If you look at the, the rich people, the wealthy, I mean, the most wealthy actually send their kids to international schools, the most wealthy. And even if they could not, they, they can find ways to find you know, foreign passports, you know, if they can go to schools. And other group of kids, you know, they send their uh, uh, wives and children to America, to Canada, to Australia, to New Zealand, to England to study, you know, all of this. And then the other kind of wealthier, you know, kind of middle class, upper middle class, they, they, their children test well, they go to good high schools. But if you have the who call or the residents in the city, even though you are poor, but if your children are good at taking tests, they can still go to good schools. And remember in China, Chinese schools are not you know, really relocated as we American schools based on community, although China has been trying to localize schools in the community to equalize education rights. And also they're talking about teacher turnover, you know, the, the wrong, the rotate teachers, school principals, However, there's this number of schools that are good uh, remains small. So you have to pass the test to do that. Thank you. Another asks, do you have data to compare the innovative level of Chinese students in the 1980s and now? And is there still similar data for that of US students? We don't have the data to compare the innovation, but uh, in the book, I analyzed, uh, the trends, the quality and quantity of scientific, scientific publications, the quality and quantity of patents uh, from uh, the, the China and the US, you know, you, you trace that in the whole thing. So the, it, it's very hard to, to determine, but so what you can really determine on is economical innovations, economic, economical prosperities. I mean, in the book, I remember writing a story, there was a city in China said, we want to produce 1,000 Steve Jobs. Uh, and there was a government plan. I said, what the heck are you trying to do? Produce 1,000 Steve Jobs. So I kind of wrote about if Steve, jo Steve Jobs were born in China, had been born in China, there would be no Steve Jobs. It would be a bad test taker. He would not make it, you know? So, so same thing with Elon Musk, you know? So think of, so all of these ideas, I, I think is that we, when we look at the education, the outcome of education, you have to look at the huge society, you know, uh, instead of just, you know, the test scores at the moment. So um, Hua Jing Maskey says that she's used your book in her classes. And since the publication of your book, the China has geared up with um, funding for education, higher education in particular. What's strong with strong funding for higher education and the double first class initiatives? Some universities in China have risen quickly to world ranking. Thinking about the future, will China become a competitor in terms of a destination country for study abroad rather than the world's number one source for market abroad? 
Thank you so much for that. I hope uh, you, you use that in your class. You will notice in one of the places I think I wrote about, China was going to stop innovating at all. You know, there's a lot of Chinese innovation were honestly, you know, pirated from other countries, invented. The, 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 whole, uh, the whole country does not really support invention. Because business can come and go. Look at Alibaba. Look at all those things. And then the education itself. You know, even the higher education, you can go up in rankings. By the ranking is an interesting game. And a lot of ranking institutions want to get money from China. The, 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 you know, you can buy rankings. And also ranking is based on really nonsense. Actually, it's not about um, what you're really good at. And so, so, you know, based on publications, for example, based on teacher-student ratios, it's, you can see the growth. You can measure the hard part. I mean, Chinese universities have definitely got better. They got better equipment. They got better in, in, uh, uh, resources. But I am not sure Chinese universities overall in terms of scientific in, um, inventions or engineering inventions will become the best competitor because that requires a much more liberal you know, uh, environment for you to be free to think differently. And all, of course, you need different students coming in. You know, after 13 years in a you know, testing preparation system, you lose passion. You lose what you can do. So that's, I think, the problem. Yeah. Thank you for using the book. Uh, no, it says, do you think it's possible to test for skills that you think that education should provide? Uh, and examples are entrepreneurship, creativity, problem solving. If so, then we could measure how well schools and teachers are doing their doing and teaching these skills. Well, I've written quite a lot about that. And I'm actually editing um, the, uh, the journal, a Review of Research in Education uh, for American Educational Research Association on the issue we call educational side effects. That is what you can, you know, <clears throat> you know we've been looking for evidence. We call evidence-based education, evidence-based policy making. And, uh, um, but if the evidence is only test scores, it doesn't matter. Then we'd say, well, how about we measure creativity? I just edited another issue of RRE, the Review of Research Education. Basically, there's no good measurement of creativity. Creativity is very complex. It is not only diverting the thinking. It is not only how many ways you can poke someone with a pencil. It, it, it is a lot more di different. It involves efficacy, involves culture, involves beliefs, involves attitudes. You cannot truly measure creativity in students. Uh, I know PISA, the OECD wants to measure. It's impossible. And, and then entrepreneurship. I wrote a book about entrepreneurship. It's the same thing you cannot truly measure because there are a lot of side effects. There, therefore, I've been promoting a different way of assessing students. It's called profiles. You build students' profile. So you follow each student and each and every student are different. You cannot compare them. And in America, we're fortunate to have the resources to provide a lot more opportunities for our children but our government policies are really driving our education to a narrow path. And it's making education much worse. And this is the same reason, you know, people are questioning, why do we need a higher education? Because you don't look at the immediate outcome. You look at the long-term scientific inventions and we are losing that. Um, this person asks, um, and I'm trying to summarize this, um, with education being so well implemented here in the US. Curious about your thoughts, reading uh, the current issues of mis and disinformation and how our country is coping with these problems. Do you think there's any correlation or anything significant to think about with this as it relates to US education? I have to tell you, um, American education as a system has not done well. You know, I'm not saying that when I was criticized in China, I was not really prison. I was more prison, you know, the school talent shows, the teachers, and the broader definition of American education. So this is a very interesting thing. But 
you look at the uh, American, education, American education has done very poorly in helping our children to understand the value of debate without fighting, to understand the importance of truth, not alternative truth, to understand and debate about different cultural and religious values. In our schools, we have stayed away from those. You look at today's schools in America right now, people are debating critical race theory, social emotional learning, we're banning books. So those are really extreme. So in this country right now, we're very divided, but that division cannot be brought back unless we discuss, unless we talk, unless we debate. I think that's something we have to deal with uh, and, and uh, get involved with. So I'm so happy that you raised that question. The future of this country is still fragile. You know, democracy is quite fragile. I'm sure you've all learned that over the past five, six years. Is, However, I do believe if we began a conversation, especially with our children, we don't want to politicize education, but education itself is political. So, so th there's a lot of things we have to deal with. I think conversation <clears throat> about that will be very good. You know, one, one, one more thing is since World War II, human beings, I thought we had learned not to fight, but look at the Russia and Ukraine, look at the geopolitical fights. It's unbelievable. We still believe in dictators. We still believe in authoritarian systems. I think that is something everyone should become alert. And, and also I just want to add some education is brainwashing. Some education is truly education to liberate people. I don't have time to explain all of this, but, th but this is really, we want to say not all schools are there to liberate, to help people grow into who they can be. Um, <clears throat> just a, uh, an interesting comment here is many concerned black advocates in the US don't want to see the end of testing and reading and math because they're concerned about schools continuing to fail um, black kids. Um, how might you respond to their concerns or other, I would say, um, minorities in schools where um, resources are allocated based on how students are doing? Well, that's precisely the problem. I, I, I did an interview several years ago about from that perspective about some civil rights leaders kept saying we got to have raised standards, do more testing. And, but if you go to any cities, Houston, uh, New York, uh, Washington, DC, you go to in these places, the poor children are made worse because we want them to do well in math and reading. You know, we have this new law in many states called, uh, if you cannot read by third grade, you cannot be promoted to fourth grade. There's a lot of, lot of big problems. I just sent a book, uh, which will be published by Teachers College Press. It's called Duck and the Cover, kind of a dubious ideas in education. And we're duck and cover in 1950s, you know, when the trying to, if our children duck and cover under desk, they can uh, run away from nuclear bombs. It's impossible, but we have those policies. So, so these tests are really further depressing our children, or we call high expectations. You know, what's our high, expect our high expectation? Poor kids do better on tests. But if they're not even engaged in school, how can they do better? Actually, Minnesota is a good example. We, we, I, I won't say more. But anyway, so, so you know, when children don't do well, what do you do? We give them more reading. And so they can hate reading more. You know, the first thing is to engage children. In America, since no child left behind, poor schools have lost more art teachers, uh, music teachers, they've added more reading specialists, but all the data over the past 30 years have not shown much improvement because we are forcing students to be someone they cannot be at that time. Thank you. <clears throat> so we have two questions kind of around this um, topic, but you mentioned briefly about student sports engagement. Would you like to elaborate on the role of K-12 education and its impact on leadership development in both China and the U.S.? And another person um, with regard to sports said that you felt the structural um, component of sports uh, is actually um, 
uh, dam damaging to, let me see what she said exactly, just um, feel like structured competitive sports are taking away from American students' childhoods that they're, I guess, too organized. You miss sports? Yes. Well, I don't know much about sports. I, I get crashed on the football field right away, so I'm useless. But, but, but you know, however, what I'm advocating is that um, children, remember, we got millions of children. They are not the same. Mm -hmm. Some love to get sports. Some love to form their own band. Some is very interested in doing art on their own. Some doing scientific exploration on their own. What I'm really advocating is uh, in, in America, we have the resources. We should enrich our children. If you, you think about it, this is kind of stupid, right? As the one of the most developed countries, we say our reading is our national out goal. I used to joke about it, you know, when we had, uh, before we had the worst president, we had another one, which we used to make fun. I think he's good now. I said, George Bush, made his own personal goal, you know, a national goal. Reading has become a national goal. That's silly. You know, for a country this with this so much resource, we can do a lot better. So what I'm really advocating is for schools, for parents, for communities, try to personalize learning for every child, which China cannot do because of resources, because of cultural traditions, because of the education and because of education system and a political system. And I think we need to think differently about education, follow the child. So is Japan doing better than China in terms of education? Japan focuses on test taking, but it seems that they do better creativity in terms of producing better cars, robots, electronics. Many years ago, uh, Japan was trying to reform its education. I think it's called happiness or something education. The their, their central government launched their reform. And then the next year, their test score slipped in international test. Then they got rid of that reform. So, so that was really, so they are back to more conservative. So I was, I've been criticized this test scores, always put you on the pedestal. You have to be very good. When you go back a little bit, they say, oh my God, we're doing worse. Let's go back. It's, I don't think Japan is doing any better at this time. Asian countries, the probably most progressive Asian system is maybe Singaporeans. You know, Singapore is trying to reform its education and they're serious. And I don't know how far they can really go because that's still many a Confucian culture, you know, uh, um, country. And so Singapore might be doing better. And, and Hong Kong, I, I don't think is doing better. Hong Kong used to be pretty good because Hong Kong used to have a lot of international schools. They have a lot of in different pedagogies. So I, I, I think, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I haven't been to Japan for about five years, so, but I don't think they're doing any better. Okay, I think this will be our last question. Um, we are running out of time here and so many questions, but many US colleges have removed standard test scores as like ACT, SAT from college admission requirements. Are you in favor or against that? What do you think? Oh, I'm in favor of getting rid of tests. It's, uh, I think MIT is probably the only uh, known institution that will want to bring it back. Uh, and the others are letting it go. Some may bring it back. I think, uh, you know, first of all, again, I've analyzed the data. Uh, SAT, SAT do not really predict your life success. They do not even predict your college success. And it's racially biased against uh, African-American students. And I know there are many institutions that have gone test optional, um, have seen their students who submitted test scores and without submitting test scores doing almost the same. There was no difference. So, so I don't think we need to return to those tests. Those tests make a lot of money for SAT and the college board and many high schools in many states are using that almost as a college, as a graduation exam, which is even worse. And that's where we will end this today. Thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate everyone's um, coming to this webinar and all the excellent questions. We just didn't have time for everything. I think we have a stack more to go through, but thanks very much, Dr. Zhao. And um, we'll end this here. Thank you everyone. Have a great day.
Thank you.